Hello, everyone. Welcome to our workshop on menstruation matters, social and sustainable equity. My name is Amy. I am a student intern at the Gender Equity Center. And today we're collaborating uh, with the Office of Sustainability student intern, Susie. And uh, she will be presenting in the second half of this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Today's agenda, uh, we will be going over Gen X services, defining menstruation, uh, defining what menstrual equity is, as well as going over taboos and stigmas that lead to misconceptions, and then we'll leave you with some resources at the end. So the Gender Equity Center, um, we strive to empower our students and educate the campus on a multitude of issues facing society based on gender. We organize and participate in a variety of events throughout the year, including the Clothesline Project, Vagina Monologues, and Take Back the Night. Some services we offer were a drop-in social space, which means that you can come into our center and hang out, do homework, or just relax. Uh, we also offer free emergency menstrual products, such as um, pads, tampons, and liners, as well as sexual barriers. Uh, we also have a lactation room, and uh, we have a lending library on gender and sexuality studies uh, books. And then for our social media, it would be at SGSU Gen Ec, and that is for Instagram and Facebook. And now we're going to go over a brief explanation of menstruation and what menstruation is, how it happens, and who menstruates. So this is um, a brief explanation. Uh, according to Planned Parenthood, menstruation is when blood and tissue from the uterus comes out of the vagina. It typically happens once a month, but it can vary for every body. Um, this is a cool diagram on how periods occur. And there's a brief explanation that there are two hormones that control your menstrual cycle, estrogen and progesterone. These hormones make up the lining of the uterus and once a month it thickens the uterine lining to provide cushion for the egg once it is fertilized. But when it is not fertilized, the lining shuts off and is excreted as blood. And so who menstruates? Anyone with the uterus menstruates. So this leads me to my next point of menstrual equity. So what is menstrual equity? Menstrual equity in its most common definition is the affordability, accessibility, and safety of menstrual products, but it is not limited to the aspects of products. It is an ideology that also talks about education and reproductive care. And menstrual equity in relation to gender equity, um, we'll be going into more of defining gender and sex, just so that uh, when we further go into this presentation, um, we can explain why we're using certain language. So here we have a gender bred person model. Uh, this is a cool diagram that kind of helps to understand gender and sex. So gender is a social construction and is the way one defines themselves. So if you could see right here, gender identity would be at the top of the gender bred person. And sex is assigned at birth based on chromosomes and genitalia. Cis means same. So cisgender is the gender identity matches with the sex assigned at birth. And transgender is the gender identity and sex assigned at birth don't align. And that is including as well non-binary folks. So menstrual equity in relation to gender equity. We found this cool picture from period, the menstrual movement on their Instagram. And it says not all women menstruate and not all people who menstruate are women. So like I mentioned, throughout this presentation, we'll be using inclusive language. Uh, instead of using women when talking about who menstruates, we will be saying menstruators or people who menstruate. And instead of saying feminine hygiene products, we will be using menstrual hygiene products. A quick um, story is that always the menstrual hygiene product um, company was actually, um, has just removed their female uh, symbol that they had on their products um, to be more inclusive of people. While yes, it is to empower women, it is also to empower all people who menstruate. So that is something cool to know. And 
We're moving on now to accessibility, affordability, and education. So the tampon tax is unfair and discriminatory economic burden. States should not profit an estimated 150 million annually from our periods. That is a quote from period equity. Um, and there's another quote from period equity that says period products should be clean and safe. So going back to the tampon tax, um, as of 2018, most states still place a luxury tax on menstrual products. This tax means items that aren't, aren't a necessity or, and are instead a luxury will be subject to taxing, while items that are necessities are exempt, such as food and medicines. However, menstrual products are taxed as luxury items, even though they are an essential part of many people's lives. And um, of the 50 states, 20 states are tax free um, of the tampon tax, but 30 states still remain. And recently, as of April 3rd, um, Washington got rid of the tampon tax, adding to the 20 states. So that was um, a really significant change. And there is still um, ways to get involved to eliminate tampon tax for the rest of the 30 states. And when it mentions about period products that should be clean and safe, when folks don't have accessibility to um, safe products or even just have like um, enough money to buy products, that can often lead to um, health issues because folks will have to use products for a longer period of time, which can be very unhealthy, or they will um, they will alternate for something that might not be as safe, such as like clothing or paper bags or um, newspaper, anything that they can really find and that is accessible to them. And that again can lead to things like toxic shock syndrome or other um, infections. And now moving on, we will be going over some taboos and stigmas. So some, um, some things that we found is that periods can often be seen as embarrassing or shameful and periods should not just because they are not just a personal issue, they are a human rights issue and public health issue. Um, oftentimes the reason we think that they are embarrassing or shameful is because we don't know enough information. It is a result of lack of education and conversations around this topic of menstruation. So the more we talk about periods, the more we can end the stigma. Another one we found is that period blood is dirty blood. And period blood is actually a combination of blood. It is also a combination of uterine tissue and mucus lining and bacteria. And lastly, we found that um, Although we are focusing a lot on like the US perspective of menstruation, we acknowledge that there's an intersection of cultures, perspectives on menstruation. And in some cultures, menstruators are not allowed to be in the same space as men. And for me, um, I identify as a Latina and in my culture, periods are something that is kept a secret and it's something that you keep to yourself. It's more of a personal, Thing that you go through kind of on your own and no one knows about it when you first get your period or at least when it happened to me it was something that I learned about but after that it was never talked about and ever any time that I had to access products or anything like that or even had to talk to someone about having cramps or needing med medicine for them it was just something that it was like a secret I had to whisper or like pull someone aside to talk to I could never um, and I would have to go to someone that was also a menstruator that knew. And so um, that was kind of my experience and continues to be still some of my experience as a Latina. Um, but like I said, as we continue to continue this conversation, we can destigmatize that. And then that leads me to some misconceptions. So some things that we found was that 
people think a regular cycle is 28 days. And although that may be true for some people, uh, not, it's not the same for everyone. Every body is different and some cycles are longer or some cycles are shorter. So as long as you know what your, your normal cycle is, then that is okay. If anything seems out of the ordinary, then that's maybe some something to check in with your doctor about. But not everyone's cycle is 28 days. Another thing we found is um, that folks think PMS is a myth. Premenstrual syndrome is what happens prior to menstruation. A menstruator hormones begin, menstruator's hormones begin to change. And that can cause different symptoms like mood changes, fatigue, and bloating. And another thing is that folks think we sync with other menstruators. That's something I thought. Um, I would see it happen within my peer group and stuff like that. And I, I just was always in awe of how that happened. But um, I did a little bit of research and it showed that there hadn't necessarily been enough evidence to suggest that sinking happen, although it may be a coincidence that we uh, menstruate at the same time as our peers, but there wasn't enough like scientific evidence to prove why or show um, how that happens. So that's something I thought was really interesting. Another thing was that uh, your period stops when you're in water and it may temporarily prevent blood from flowing out of the vagina, like say you're taking a bath, uh, because of the water pressure. However, it doesn't necessarily stop the bleeding from happening. So hot baths can actually relieve cramps. And so that is a good way to kind of relax and get rid of the that pain. Um, and yeah. So then something to think about. So some of these questions we kind of want you to um, just keep in mind is why is this important for our campus community? And so it is important to continue this conversation to destigmatize and to educate um, on menstruation, as well as to know like the resources available. Our campus is a commuter school and there are not enough places on our campus to access menstrual hygiene products. We have a significant number of students and being in Silicon Valley, a lot of folks are homeless. Um, this means that a lot of students don't have either the money or even the luxury to go to a bathroom that has free products to grab um, any, like a pad, liner, or tampon if they get their period. There are also, um, now there are places where you can access products, but they're not nearly enough on the entire campus. And that leaves students to have to um, result to like an, an option of going to a convenience store like 7-Eleven or any other stores nearby that can often be very expensive for the amount of products that you get. So who does this impact? It, imp it impacts everyone, uh, whether it's with the uterus or without a uterus. Um, the more we know about the resources available, the more we can either help a friend in need or just help ourselves if we need some, we need to access hygiene products. And how can we continue this conversation? So a great way to do that is to just simply talk about it with our peers, with family, um, with friends, or even show them this video. That's a really good way is to just, you know, sit with friends or send it to them so that we can continue this conversation on menstruation and destigmatize it. And lastly, here are some resources. So on the SJSU campus, we have the Gender Equity Center, which allows uh, for emergency menstrual products. The Student Union Women's Restrooms now have um, free menstrual hygiene products in the dispensers. However, it's not all restrooms. Um, and the Wellness Center also sells menstrual hygiene products at a low cost. And then we'll provide some links in our description down below of different resources um, off campus and online at the end of this video. 
So now I'll be handing it over to Susie. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, hello and welcome to the Office of Sustainability's presentation on the Zero Waste Period. My name is Susie Zerby. I am the Zero Waste Intern for the Office of Sustainability. Um, you can visit our website for some resources and about what we do. Um, you can even sign up for our newsletter there. So, uh, a little agenda for today. I'll be going over the history of the period. I'll be talking about some of the facts about the products that we currently use. Um, I will go over what happens when we dispose of our menstrual products. And then I'll wrap it up with showing you guys some alternative options that you might be interested in. So let's get started. When we think period, we think of these two products right here, the pad and the tampon. The most, they, these are the most popular menstrual products, but um, as I'll cover in this presentation, they're actually the most detrimental products for our planet. Historically, there's always been a stigma around menstruation. As Amy was saying earlier, it's always been seen as disgusting and unclean. Um, before the 1900s, menstruators used reusables. Um, they couldn't just go to the store and buy tampons or pads. Um, so a lot of women free bled. Uh, they wore a lot of, in the time when they were wearing like multi-layer dresses, this was pretty common and actually pretty easy. Um, some uh, menstruators used cloth diapers, some used cloth buttoned to a belt, and some even used pads or towels held up with suspenders. So during World War I, um, women were nurses on the front lines. They discovered how well gauze could soak up blood and they started creating makeshift tampons. Uh, in the 1920s, women began entering the workforce, and so there became this idea that women needed to hide their menstruation so as to not disrupt the workplace. So disposables became the desired option because of their convenience and discreetness. Um, some companies saw this, as an, uh, saw this as an opportunity to capitalize, um, and they saw it as guaranteed purchases for decades. Um, they also created tampon applicators so that women weren't touching their own genitals. So let's talk about some facts. So in 2018 alone, people in the US bought 5.8 billion tampons, 12 billion pads and 7 million tampons pollute US landfills annually. Um, over the course of a lifetime, a single menstruator will use somewhere between five and 15,000 pads and tampons which end up as plastic waste in the landfill. Um, most American menstruators menstruate for 40 years in their lifetime. So that's five days a month for 40 years. So that's totaled about 2,400 days or six and a half years of menstruation total, which is crazy. Um, and then uh, I like this graphic because it shows how many products a single menstruator uses. Um, this dark red line over here on the left shows about how many products are used by a single menstruator in one month. So that's 22 products. And then to the right of that, you'll see like a lighter shade of red and that's one year's worth of products used by a single menstruator, 264. And then all of this lighter shade all to the right is how many products are used in 10 years, which is 2,640 which is crazy because if you think about how many people menstruate in the United States, let alone in our world, that's a lot of products um, that are being used. Uh, and then this little gray line down here at the bottom shows the lifetime of a menstrual cup. Uh, and it, it's a one-time purchase and then you can use it for like 10 years. But um, I'll go into more detail on the menstrual cup later on. So what happens to our menstrual products when they leave us? Well, let's start, of course, with what these products are made out of. So with tampons, you have a thin plastic packaging, you have a thick plastic applicator, you have the string, which is mixed, kind of cotton mixed with plastic for, uh, to last, and then the tampon itself is again cotton mixed with plastic. The pad is 
It has, again, the thin plastic packaging. It has an adhesive part, um, which is made out of thin plastic so that it can stick to your underwear. And then you have the leak-proof base, which is plastic. And then the pad itself is, again, cotton mixed with plastic. Um, the pads are actually, they contain more plastic than tampons, uh, surprisingly. Uh, so what is the problem with these materials? Well, let's go ahead and start with cotton. So cotton is a thirsty crop, which means it requires a lot of water to grow. Um, and most companies use non-organic cotton, which contains pesticides and insecticides. It's not good. Um, and then we have plastic. And for those of you who don't know, plastic is made from crude oil and it is heated up to create plastic. So crude oil is a non-renewable resource. And once this plastic is created, um, which takes a lot of energy, um, it isn't biodegradable and it takes a long, long time to break down. Um, every piece of plastic that has been made pretty much still exists. It just breaks down into microplastics and who knows where they go. Um, the other bad thing about plastic is it contains chemicals like polyethylene, dioxin, chlorine, rayon. Um, those are a result of the heating process with the crude oil. Um, and some of these um, chemicals are actually cancer causing. So we have to be careful with those. So what does this all mean? So all types of plastic used in menstrual products are not recyclable because of their purpose. Um, even the wrappers, if they don't touch any of the blood or anything, they're still not recyclable because they're made out of thin plastic, which can't even be broken down and used again. Um, so all these conventional menstrual products that we use, our tampons and our pads, they're going to the landfill. They're, that's how they're being disposed of. Um, at the landfill, uh, the problem is that these chemicals from the plastic products are getting soaked up by the earth and are released as pollution into our groundwater and our air. Um, and the bottom line <laughs> is that these harmful chemicals should really not be going anywhere near the most sensitive area of your body. Um, so this graphic is from a study done in India. Uh, they were having issues with figuring out how to dispose of menstrual products. Uh, they were basically just piling up in the streets. Um, so one pad can take anywhere from 500 to 800 years to decompose. Um, that's a long time, um, past our time. Um, and then they tried burning these products because they were like, how are we going to get rid of these? We don't want them sitting in our landfill. So they were burning them, but that um, released really highly toxic emissions. So that was out of the question. Um, so one pad can take anywhere from 500 to 800 years to decompose. Um, that's a long time, um, past our time. Um, and then they tried burning these products because they were like, how are we gonna get rid of these? We don't want them sitting in our landfill. So they were burning them, but that um, released really highly toxic emissions. So that was out of the question. So one pad is the equivalent of uh, four plastic bags. So a menstruator will use about 50 plastic bags each month. Um, I really like this quote. Uh, it's by the creators of Organica. That's a menstrual cup company. Um, they, they say, it is relevant today to think about the impact our periods have on the environment. Like, who knew that our menstruation practices were contributing to the amounts of plastic waste in landfills? Uh, we were just handed these products when we began our period and like we've never really thought much of it because it's just the way we do menstruation. Um, and now we're seeing problems in the world like China isn't accepting our plastic waste anymore. So um, there becomes this importance uh, that we need to be considering what products we're buying and using and where they're going. What are our alternatives? How can we help? Is there something we can do? Yes, there is. So there is, first we have the menstrual cup. It's a flexible cup made from either silicone 
rubber, or latex. And no, you can't feel it when you insert it. It can last anywhere from four to 12 hours. You boil it to clean it the first time, and you can boil it in between cycles as well to keep it clean. Uh, between uses, uh, you'll take it out, you empty it in the toilet, you rinse it off and reinsert it. It's a really simple process. Um, one cup is about $40, but it is a purchase that will last you anywhere from five to 10 years, depending on the brand. So, let's see. There are different menstrual cups in all different shapes and sizes. Um, depending on the brand, they'll have, um, their, they'll have their own sets of sizes each. Um, I've been using a menstrual cup for about six months now. I have a pretty medium flow, not light, but also not too heavy. Um, if you use the cup, you'll see you actually produce a lot less blood on your period than you think you do. Uh, personally, me, I leave the cup in for the full 12 hours when I'm at school, work, whatever, and I've never filled the cup ever all the way. So um, I use a Maluna cup. It's, it isn't on this chart, but I purchased it from a zero waste store that's in downtown San Jose. So how to use a menstrual cup? So you start by washing your hands, of course, and then you'll fold the cup. Each web or each brand will have instructions on how to use the cup, but this is just a little overview so you guys can get an idea of what it looks like. So you fold the cup, you insert it, you'll leave it in there for a maximum of 12 hours, and then once that time is up, you'll take it out, empty it in the toilet, and you can just wash it back up, uh, wash it back off, and repeat the process all over again. So here's another option for. Uh, people who like wearing are using menstrual pads. Um, we have the reusable pad. Um, it's typically made of three layers. So the top layer is an antibacterial shield, uh, the middle layer is for absorbance, and then the bottom layer is laminated to prevent leakage. And this also, most of them button to your underwear. Um, some, might, some other options might be Velcro, et cetera. Um, after you use it, it can be folded and buttoned. Uh, these pads can last anywhere from two to six hours, depending on brand, size, and your flow. And these can be purchased anywhere. Like, uh, you can buy them from Etsy, you can um, just Google it. A common concern when people are talking about reusable pads is where they will put them uh, when they're at work um, or at school. So uh, there's this thing called a wet bag. Uh, it's a pretty similar process if you use reusable diapers for your children, um, but you can either make your own wet bag or purchase. It's a bag with plastic lining to keep the pads from leaking or smelling in your bag. And some have outer pockets where you can store the unused pads like this one here. I also put a link under this picture, but we will also include it in the description. And it's for a blog post that explains how to get started with um, cloth pads if you're interested. And then we have um, the menstrual underwear. So it works pretty much the same as a reusable pad, except for the pad is built into the underwear. Um, and there's also many styles to choose from. So uh, yeah, these pads can be machine washed or hand washed based on the brand, but um, pretty easy to use. So again, um, I am not a professional. Uh, my presentation was meant to be informative and thought-provoking. Um, so if you are feeling unsure, please do your own research, um, talk to your doctor, and in the end, please do what you are most comfortable with. Uh, there is no shame in using disposables. So thank you for listening. Um, if you do have any questions, I would be happy to answer them at this email below. Uh, Please follow the Office of Sustainability on Instagram at SJSU Green Campus. We're also on Facebook under the same name. Uh, we post about resources on campus, ways to get involved, and helpful tips so that you can be more sustainable. And then Amy will be finishing up with reading off some action items for us. Yeah, so these are just ways to get involved after listening to this presentation and you're thinking, how can I get more involved? Um, 
one way is to join the tam tampon tax protest to support the removal of, of tampon tax in the remaining 30 states. And that is by visiting the tax-free period um, link that again, we will be providing in the description. Um, another way is during this time right now um, to support the emergency grants for period supplies. Uh, you could do that by sending the petition to make menstrual hygiene supplies accessible through period supply programs, which um, provide menstrual hygiene products for low income and homeless folks uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak right now that is currently happening. Another way is to donate and join period the menstrual movements monthly giving club or you can always donate a minimum of $10 to serve menstruators. And lastly, like Susie mentioned, make informed decisions when purchasing and do your own research before you buy any products. Thank you all for joining us on this conversation and we hope that you all continue it.